Is that official? Alrighty. Okay, everybody. Um, it's great to see all of you here. Thank you all for coming. My name is Denise Pennard. I'm a volunteer with the UC Master Gardeners of Monterey and Santa Cruz counties. And I'd like to welcome you to today's program on starting tomatoes and peppers from seed. Um, you know, as usual, we're pretty used to Zoom these days, but just to get a couple of things out of the way, um, please double check that your microphone is muted. Um, and we also ask uh, that you go ahead and turn off your video. It really helps with distractions and helps the presentation run smoothly and our, our bandwidth cover everything. Um, for your best experience, we recommend that you use speaker view, get the the biggest bang out of all of our great uh, pictures and slides and a demo coming up later on. Um, if you have any technical questions, go ahead and just uh, uh, message me in the chat and we'll get you going as best we can here. Uh, down at the bottom of the screen, we have our live transcript enabled today. And uh, you can go ahead and click on that if you'd like to have uh, sort of a, a little closed caption uh, feature going as well. Um, you can submit questions anytime during uh, the program. Just go ahead and put them um, in the chat and we'll get to those at the end of the program. Um, you might've noticed that the program is being recorded um, and you will receive a link to the recording and the whole presentation within a few days. All righty. So for those of you who don't know as much about our Master Gardener program, um, we are part of the UC uh, Cooperative Extension Program. It's been around for around 40 years now. We're all volunteers. We work in partnership with the Agriculture and Natural Resources Division at the University of California. We all receive comprehensive training and provide outreach and research-based education on horticulture, pest management, and sustainable practices to uh, home gardeners in our local community. Um, now that you know a little bit about us, I'm going to go ahead and just turn this over to our speaker for today, Julie Square. Thank you everybody for being here. This is one of my favorite topics. I love starting seeds. Um, and uh, I have a different hairdo in this picture. <clears throat> I have BAs in biology and environmental studies. I have an MBA in sustainable business practices. I became a master gardener in 2014, and I have a, a deep interest in food, food crops, growing them, food justice, and medicinal herbs. That's my, my latest passion. I love to teach, so thank you all for being here. Today's class, we are gonna go over everything soup to nuts from Choosing, uh, choosing your plants, choosing your, your solanaceous plants. Solanaceous means nightshade or um, tomato, pepper, eggplant family. We're just gonna focus on those three, three crops and they have a little bit more advanced seed starting requirements. So that's why we're focusing on those. And we're talking all about getting to the point of transplanting them into the ground. So not so much about growing them after that, but um, I will answer any questions you have at the end of the, of the session. We're going to talk for an hour, blah, blah, and then you will have a chance to ask questions. And feel free to put your questions in the chat, and we will kind of keep track of them uh, and then get back to them at the end of, this, of the presentation. So let us meet the nightshade family, known as deadly nightshade or solanaceae. And um, they're not really as deadly as they say, some plants more than others, but there are over 3,000 species in the world. So all kinds of plants, potatoes are solanaceous, uh, datura is solanaceous. But if you look at the tomato, eggplant, and pepper, the flowers are all very similar. Five petals and this little, little uh, lobed stamen in the front. Um, so you can see that they look similar. And um, that may be part of why when they were first introduced to Europe, people thought they were poisonous because they were familiar with the poisonous versions um, of, of nightshade. But then this, this love apple, this tomato came along and they're like, hmm, not sure about this. I like to do a little background on where the plant originally came from. 
So we're going to look at each of those here. Tomatoes are a tropical perennial. They are native to the Americas. If we had warmer winters, we could grow them, grow them all year round, but we, that's very hard to do outside of a greenhouse situation. There are uh, two branches that sort of originated, one in the Andes and the other in Ecuador. And um, they've been domesticated and were introduced to Mexico in the, by the Aztecs. Um, when Europe started sending boats all around the world, um, that was the Dutch and the English and um, the Spanish in the 1500s, uh, they came from the New World to us. And now in just 15, or just 5,000 years, there are over 10,000 cultivars to shoot to choose from. Um, Wikipedia has a list, it's not a complete list, but it just gives you an idea of some of the known and popular cultivars. And just so you can see where they came from, here's the original tomato from the Andes. And here is a big fat Costaludo tomato that you would grow in your backyard. Chilies are an even older um, grown, grown product, also native to the Americas, also tropical perennial. And many pre-Columbian civilizations throughout South and Central America grew them introduced at the same time. And what I love about these is that they co-evolved with birds. So um, a lot of plants that are fruiting are distributed by mammals, but uh, mammals can taste the capsicum, which is the, the fiery spicy part in the peppers and the chilies. Um, and birds don't have that capability. So they're able to eat the fruits and then distribute the seeds and fly far, far away with them. So that's why there are over 50,000 cultivars of capsicum now and five different species to choose from. So many. Eggplants came from the other direction. So they're native to, and nobody's sure because it's such an ancient, ancient crop. India could be China and then North Africa. In, in Africa, there's wild, wild types of eggplants growing all over the continent. It's a much more delicate tropical perennial, so it's a little finickier and harder to grow. Thousands of years it's been cultivated and it was brought to the Mediterranean by the Arabs, uh, to Spain, mostly in the uh, 8th century via the Silk Road. Fascinating stuff. So seeds are amazing tiny little packages of life that just grow into these amazing luscious tomatoes. Tiny little seeds. When you're choosing what to grow, you have to think about where it's going to grow and how you're going to grow it in order to be successful. The, the point of this class is to help you be successful in our area. And by our area, I mean the Monterey Bay uh, area, which is Monterey and Santa Cruz, everywhere from the coast to um, the mountains and inland areas. So one thing you need to know about is what's your microclimate? Um, how are you going to grow them? Are you going to put them in the ground? Are you going to put them in a, in a raised bed? Uh, do you get a real foggy summer like I do? Do you have inland heat uh, because you're lucky that way and you're in Carmel Valley? Do you, um, do you have shade because you're up in the, in the woods, in the forest? Have you had soil-borne diseases in the past? If you know this, you can choose your plants accordingly in order to be successful. All three plants share some cultural requirements. And here, this is a great list of tips. And I wanna thank all the master gardeners uh, that responded to my request to tell me what they've grown and grown successfully. We have a short list of, of what works in this area by people who have actually grown them out. <clears throat> so they're grown as annuals here. You can overwinter a small pepper plant with special treatment, but um, that's rare, it's hard. Um, so we treat them as annuals and they really like 70 to 85 degrees or, or even warmer for eggplants in particular and peppers. Um, it's not really smart to start them too early because they will just sit there and be unhappy and, and chilly. <laughs> they need a lot of sun. So whether you've uh, got sun in your garden area, eight to 12 hours, 
or not, if you don't have that kind of sun, you can always go for a container and move that to the driveway or wherever the sun actually is, because all of them do pretty well in containers. They germinate, all of them, within 10 to 21 days, some quicker than others. Tomatoes are a little quicker. Um, like I said, you don't want to set them out too early. I usually shoot for April 1st. You can do it a little bit earlier than that, but not too much. You, you want to think about the nighttime temperatures as well as the daytime temperatures. Early maturing varieties are the ones that seem to work. And you want to pick the ones that are under 80 days to mature. Uh, small fruited varieties tend to work also. Um, everybody can grow a cherry tomato. That's the good news, no matter where you are. <laughs> you want to feed and water them regularly, and they're self-pollinating. So you don't have to have male and female plants. Um, the bees come and they do kind of visit the flowers and they shake them around and that helps pollinate and set fruit, but that's not required. They all need some staking and they all need to be rotated annually to avoid soil borne disease. And by, by rotating, what that means is uh, you want to grow them in a different place every year for at least five years in a row. And I know that lots of people have a little corner that gets the sun that they need uh, somewhere in their yard and they plant their tomato there year after year. Bad idea. You're inviting disease. Uh, use containers if you can. Some of the challenges to our area, we've talked a little bit about this coastal fog, and here's the mitigation plan. Uh, not enough sun, use a pot. Ambient cool temperatures, um, you can plant it beside a wall or something with reflected heat and maybe a little overhang, that can be very helpful. If the soil temperature is too cool, like below 50 degrees, you can pre-warm it with black plastic, a mulch, or you can just wait because it's not time to plant yet. If you've got any history of soil-borne diseases, you definitely want to grow in, in pots or grow bags or not in the place where the disease is happening because it's very hard to get it out of your soil. And if you've ever had blossom end rot, which is a little brown spot at the bottom of the tomato or pepper, try adding calcium to the planting hole. That's bone meal or azomite. And uh, if you start late, purchase seedlings um, in the store or come to our plant sale. Okay, developmental stages. It starts as a tiny, tiny seed and grows into a big old plant. Wanted to point out this anatomy. The first seed that comes out is a cotyledon, also known as a seed leaf. Never transplant when there's just a cotyledon. You wanna wait, wait till there's at least two true leaves and they're the lobed ones. Uh, those are the ones you're going to want to look for, and then you may be ready to do transplanting. Depending on what you want to do, if you're looking, there are different reasons to get open pollinated or heirloom seeds as opposed to hybrid seeds. Hybrid seeds are the cross of two different genetic strains that together make the seed that you're growing. And if you were to save seed, it would revert to one of the parents it, or, or yeah, it would revert and it wouldn't be the same plant. It wouldn't, it wouldn't grow the same plant the following year. So hybrids are bad for seed saving, but they're, they're good for vigor. Sometimes hybrids are more vigorous. Sometimes hybrids are um, more disease resistant. Uh, they have certain features they've been bred for. So there are reasons to get hybrids. But a lot of us are interested in the open pollinated seeds because it's so cool to save seed and or you just like the idea of the heirloom varieties that were grown by our grandmothers and uh, may have special flavor components. Um, I, I always look for that. So sometimes the open pollinated seeds have seed or disease resistant um, of a certain kind. You need to do your research and find out all about them. Uh, there, I don't think there are any genetically engineered um, commercially available for the home gardener seed, so I wouldn't worry about that. So tomatoes that you can grow here and be successful. They're ones that are bred for cool weather in particular. A couple of examples are Oregon Springs, San Francisco Fog, and Alaska. We've seen those two first two. 
on on the shelves of um, many a plant store. Um, like I said, hybrids tend to be more forgiving and disease resistant. Here's a couple of examples. Early girl, the popular tomato. Everybody seems to love it. Um, lots. It's an early one. It's a small fruited one, and it's like I said, very disease resistant. And then if you're gonna grow in a container, consider growing a determinant type. That means that it's a bush type. It's not gonna get so rangy. It's not gonna just grow all over the place and need staking and trellising and um, the way a lot of you know tomatoes go. Those are indeterminate tomatoes. So a couple of examples are here, Superbush Inca Jewel. Oh my gosh, that produced more more fruit than I could imagine when I grew that in my backyard. And the good news is that everybody, according to my research, uh, my direct research with other master gardeners in the area is that we can all, even if we're like living at the beach, can grow cherry tomatoes. So that's your fallback. Here are some great tips on um, doing your research. This tomato fest, I'm gonna open it up. Let's see if we can you guys see this? Can you see a website? Somebody answer me verbally. Yes. yes. Okay, yes. great. So they're all heirloom and they're all organic. We're not advocating you buy from them, but for research purposes, they're great. Um, and there's there's categories. They, they organize by cool climate tomatoes, by determinate tomatoes, um, by different colors, Gary's personal favorites. So this is a fun place to look. And this tomatogrowers.com catalog is a downloadable catalog. You can get the PDF, but um, it's, it's free for the PDF download. And it has, again, tons of information about tons of tomatoes and peppers. So there you have it. So let's talk about peppers. Sweet peppers, if you're looking for a bell pepper and you want the really thick walled big bell peppers, <clears throat> they're not gonna get that thick walled here because we just don't have the heat. Um, it, depending on where you are, of course, if you're in the valley or you're in a warmer area that's away from the coastal climate, uh, you can probably get some pretty hefty bells. But remember, you're only gonna get you know, maybe five peppers on that plant. That's just the way they are. Try early to mature varieties or small ones, or you can, and with peppers, you can harvest when they're green and not wait for that um, beautiful color to come up. The color also, um, when they're mature and colored, they have loads more vitamin C than when they're green. But for some reason, we eat green peppers. So there you have it. The good ones to try are lipstick. This chocolate bell came up several times. Uh, mini or baby bells lunchbox is from Johnny's. Cupid and arrows, those are from Johnny's too. Ace, these are all just some things to go look at that would most likely work for you. If you're into medium hot peppers, there are Italian um, and, and uh, other frying peppers, Spanish frying peppers. And uh, these are like Corno di Toro type, if you know what that is. Jimmy Nardello is one of my very favorite. Padrones were all the rage a couple of years ago. Great frying pepper. Ancho and Pablano, you can do lots of great Mexican food things. Shishito is a lot like Padron. And chili peppers that you're, if you're, if you're the guy in the room that wants to have the hottest pepper in the whole world, and it's going for ghost peppers and, fancy habaneros, they're not gonna get that, that hot in this area. It's just not hot enough. So if it's hundred degrees in Arizona, you might get some really spicy peppers, but here, you know, you'll be okay. The jalapenos do well. This hot paper lantern is a container bread, uh, small habanero type. It, that got pretty hot for me. Fresno, Serrano, Thai chilies, Bulgarian carrots. These are all some varieties that I've had some experience with or heard about that should do well and get pretty hot. But again, not the hottest, hottest. And kind of like tomatoes, if you, if you grew up in the Midwest and you know what a tomato is really supposed to taste like, it's really hard to get that here. We just don't have the heat. 
Again, hybrids are more forgiving and almost all peppers do well in containers. Just go with one per pot. And then I've um, offered you some lists of, of resources. I say Renee's garden, I call them out specifically because they have a trial garden in Felton, California. And that is a really good, you know, that's a good, she doesn't sell anything that doesn't work in her trial garden. So everything that she can grow there, you can probably grow where you are, depending on your microclimate. Now, eggplants are a little harder and I would never even attempt a big Italian round purple eggplant like you get at the grocery store. Um, they're very tender and they really like it when the ambient temperature is 70 degrees or, or higher and they're very heavy feeders. So you don't plant them out until the temperatures at night are, are pretty high, 55 degrees. And those small Asian style eggplants um, in the warmest spot in the yard uh, will do really well for you. I got, I can get a lot of, of those little Italian, I'm sorry, little Asian eggplants, um, the skinny guys um, on one plant and they grow really well in a container. So Kinazawa seed is a great place for Asian vegetables of all kind. And uh, Renee grows, uh, offers them as well. Um, most of us have seeds sitting around if we are gardeners. Um, if you do have seeds, you, you hopefully kept them cool, kept them dry and in a dark place at a rate away from rodents and, and weevils. Um, if you did keep them properly, you can use this little seed viability chart to find out what any seed is gonna, what its lifespan is gonna be. How long can you keep a seed and have it still be viable? So for tomatoes, they're all pretty long lasting, three to seven years for tomato seed. I'm gonna plant some today that are a year old. Uh, peppers, two to five years and eggplants, four to five. I think that's awesome. If you are in doubt, you can either just sow very thickly and hope for the best, or you can test germination. And that's a really easy process of putting out a paper towel or two um, on a plate, uh, lay out your little seeds, cover them with another paper towel, keep it moist, put it in a warm area and see what germinates and you'll get a percentage germination if you do a 10 by 10, 10 grid. Don't get them too wet or they will rot. Okay, let's get into the meat of it, starting seeds. Um, a word about potting mix. So potting mixes, seed starting mixes um, are, are thought of as a separate category than potting mix or potting, potting soil. Um, and there's a number of ways to go about that. You can go and buy a little bag of seed starting mix, which has basically three ingredients in it and you pay a lot of money and it will be supposedly uh, sterile, sterile, uh, you know, no organic material in it. So there's no dirt, there's no compost. There's no nutrients in it either. Usually you read the ingredients, um, but it's very light, very fluffy and easy for the roots to penetrate. And it's really just to get the seed started. And shortly after you have to transplant it or fertilize it or get it, um, get it some food. So things you might, um, might run into on that ingredient list are cocoa peat. So that's the uh, coir, I call it. It's a uh, cocoa, coconut husk that's kind of ground up. Peat moss, which is mined. It's basically a fossil crop. It's not sustainable. It takes hundreds of years to make peat moss and it really acidifies. So then they have to add a, an alkalizing agent to make it more, um, make it the right pH. So I don't recommend peat moss. I really like coir. Perlite, it's a, it's a mineral and it's kind of blown up. It's kind of heat treated. So it's very light, it's very fluffy and it's good for drainage. Pumice does the same thing, but it's a much heavier material. Um, so I wouldn't recommend that for starting these kinds of seeds, but it's good for drainage and aeration. And vermiculite uh, is a water holding, again, a mineral based product um, that uh, takes some energy to make it, make it happen. 
Um, sand is another thing that can be added to seed starting mixes, but um, that kind of makes it heavier. It's good for cactus, not so good for tomatoes. So how about you? What are you going to do? Well, you can, like I say, go buy the soilless mix, um, or you can make your own. You can go buy these ingredients and you can kind of mix them up yourself. Or if you're a lazy, lazy gardener like me, you can get some bagged potting soil and then uh, improve it with, I use perlite and sometimes vermiculite, rice hulls, maybe even compost. You run the risk of introducing some soil borne disease that way, but um, that's generally how I do it because I'm so lazy. This I can't stress enough. Um, the, the disease you're going to run into is called damping off disease. We'll talk about it more later. Uh, but it's really important if you're using pots that you grew something in the year before or that you bought a plant in and you want to repurpose it, it's really important to sterilize the pot. So I wash it in soapy water and then dip it or soak it in a bleach solution that's nine parts water and one part bleach. If you're not a bleach person, you don't believe in using bleach, you can uh, wash the pots, hit them hard with a stream of water and then leave them in bright sunshine. And that can help too. And that's gonna improve your chances because if you don't do that and you're transferring disease to your, your little seedlings, you can have a very bad time, get very sad. And then you don't have to pay for pots. You can, you can use, you can use cottage cheese containers, you can use uh, milk jugs. You can be very creative with the kind of containers that you upcycle, uh, but the whole bleach rinsing uh, treatment and sunshine that uh, still applies. And then of course you can use the grid uh, type containers. This is a professional kind of situation and we're going to fill one, we're going to, we're going to look at this in just a minute, but um, you want to fill them to the top and then I just sort of drop them, sort of drop them to uh, remove air pockets and help the soil settle. So if you fill them up to the very top and just run your hand over the top and then uh, drop them a couple of times, you, um, you get a very good sort of solid bunch of dirt without compressing it. You don't want to compact the soil. Um, labeling. I can't say enough importantness about labeling. <laughs> um, it's very important. You will forget what you planted. You won't be able to figure it out later. So when I pick out my little seed packet, that's when I write the label. And uh, that helps me. And I keep them together until I plant. But that's really important. You're going to plant the general rule of thumb with planting seeds is you plant them twice the circumference of the seed or the or the width of the seed. So with tomatoes that's, and peppers, that's a really tiny amount. Um, you might want to make a little depression in the soil or you might want to just put them on the soil surface and then cover with a little more soil and press them in a little bit. Uh, so it depends on how you're planting and we'll, we'll look at two strategies in just a minute. And then watering is, uh, it's essential that you get that right through the seedling stages. Um, so the early, when you first sow them, you always want to make sure you're using a kind of gentle rain type of, type of water delivery method um, so that they don't get displaced because they can just get washed off to the side of the pot and that's not a good thing. So you want to do the gentle rain and you want to keep them evenly moist, not soggy, but evenly moist when they're first germinating. And then once they've emerged, you wanna make them just a little bit drier and you can, uh, you'll get this slide deck so you can read through these more, more specifically. And when they're a little older, they can dry out a little bit more in between waterings. Uh, this is a very much art more than a science. So um, I'm gonna leave that there. Here are watering devices, these rows, um, Haws watering cans are awesome. They're very expensive. Um, you can also make something with a plastic jug and a hot paper clip and make your own little rain thing. That works too. 
And in order to um, make or help these tropical perennials germinate, you need to think like a tropical perennial seed. You want warmth and eggplants want it really warm. Tomatoes want it pretty darn warm and so do peppers. So you need to somehow heat the soil and usually a heat mat is the best way to go. Um, that can be done a number of ways. So I'll show you my heat mat in just a minute. Uh, you can buy little, uh, little thermostat options that are add-ons to these very inexpensive heat mats. I think the heat mats are 10 or 20, they're between 10 and $15 for small one. Um, and then the thermostats, I haven't got one of those. I don't use it. I just plug it in and let it go. And if it seems like it's too hot, I put a towel over it. Uh, there's heating cables you can put in a sand bed. There's you, this, this person creatively used lights. But uh, if I were, if I were you, I would just recommend um, buying one of these little heat mats or everyone seems to have a heating pad from the drugstore. I've used those wrapped in towels and the old top of the refrigerator idea. I'm not sure if that's true with the modern refrigerators, but um, at least it's warm at the, it's the warmest part of the room. So that might do it too. This is really important. So if you don't get the light right, you're not gonna be successful. If seedlings are reaching for the light, these kind in particular, they will get leggy. That's called leggy. And they're called stretching also. Um, that will make them weak. And it indicates a lack of light or an insufficient light. And it's really kind of hard to tell you how important and how difficult it is without artificial light or a greenhouse to get plants not to stretch like this. If you're just putting it in a window, that's usually not enough. Um, so that might require a little special equipment as well. You can prevent them stretching to the left or the right by flipping the trays. If you are using a window kind of a situation and you wanna make sure they don't get too much water if they're stretching, that's another reason that might happen. Um, and if it's too hot, sometimes they can do that. So mostly it's light related, but let's look at light options. How can you provide them the light they need? Well, uh, here's somebody that has a, a window with a big windowsill and you can see these guys are in the shade. These guys are in the sun and there's a bar of shade here. I don't, I don't think that would really be enough light unless it's there all day long. And sometimes in a window, you can, you can get a real, it can get really hot. It's the other thing. And then you can just fry your seedlings. This down here is a greenhouse. Um, a greenhouse is a good way to do it too. Um, so this is by a window with a heating mat here. Again, I guess we have a window situation. But if you're doing a window and they're all leaning towards the window, you definitely want to rotate, um, rotate the flat container. So here are some DIY greenhouse ideas. Um, you can get one of these baker's racks and this has got a fancy cover on it. You can buy these, um, they're a little pricey. I recommend just floating row fabric, agri-fabric and uh, clothespins. That works really well. I used that for years. Um, this is a kind of an interesting open and close deal that somebody made out of, I don't know what these wire things are, but this is a brilliant idea that I saw recently. Using these clear totes, you can get a kind of a mini greenhouse. You can, uh, uh, you can turn the, um, the lid so it's just letting a little air in and then you've definitely got a greenhouse effect going. You can take them in and out for, for your hardening off phase. Seems really convenient. And I think I'm gonna try that this year. And then you can buy lights. So I'm gonna show you some light setups I have. I just had, uh, I just put in my garage, something like this. I went to Lowe's and I bought these um, shop lights that are little LED lights that hang on a chain. They're three feet long, they fit perfectly. And I think they were $11 a piece. They were really quite cheap. 
So that was awesome. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and we're going to do an actual planting demo. Denise, can you pin the phone? It's up. Okay, I'm not seeing it. Speaker view. Have you pinned for everyone? Yes, we can see it too. Okay, so you can see my hand. Yes. Okay, for some reason I can't and that's disturbing me. Let me see if I can find it. There it is. Oh. All right, I'm going to be flying blind here. So tell me what you're seeing. Okay, not right now. <laughs> if, if there's a problem. Okay. okay, I have potting soil here. It has been amended with the perlite, little white guys. It has been amended with a lot of coir. And I also put a handful of fish meal in there. And that's going to be helpful later. And then I moistened it. So it's nice and moist. And that's what I'm going to do. So here's my container. I already got it dirty, but it was soaked in the bleach solution and washed. So let's, let's do a six pack. Get it totally up to the top. Pull out any chunks. We don't want chunk style potting soil. And then here's what I mean by dropping it. You just sort of drop it, and that helps settle it. Okay, now I'm just going to make a little divot. A little divot. A little divot. All right, I got six little holes, and I'm going to put two seeds in each. And what am I going to do? Let's see. Can you see that? Is it upside down? No, it's good. Okay. All right. So this is a Carmen pepper. It is, um, it is a Corno de Toro type. It's red and it's delicious. So it's a hybrid sweet pepper. I have already made my label. I wrote Carmen F1, meaning it's a hybrid sweet pepper. And I, and I created this on, does anybody know what this is? It's window blinds. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's a Venetian blind that I cannibalized and, and made a wonderful little plant. This oh. justifies why I have saved blinds for a year in my garage. <laughs> exactly. And thank you for your little helper there. All right. So I'm just going to pour a couple seeds into my, into my hand. And with two fingers, you just take them and drop them in. At least there's a question about why you're putting two seeds in each hole. Well, I'm putting two because one might not work and I can always get rid of the other one um, when they come up. So it's just hedging my bets that I'm going to get actually six plants. I might get 12 plants and then, uh, then I will have to take a little scissor and cut a plant, cut of one of the stems of one of the plants because you don't want to pull them apart and disturb the root zone um, in this case. Great. All right, so I've got seeds and holes and then I'm just going to do that. I'm just going to make a little, little bit of rain happen on that on those seeds. And they're just barely covered. And then I'm going to pat them down ever so slightly. Da -da -da. And then I've got my rose hose. That? Yeah. So I'm going to water them. I'm going to water them in good. Okay, we've planted a six pack. I'm going to put it aside and I'm going to show you another possible technique. So if you want to keep them in the six pack for a while, that's what you would do. 
if you have limited space on your heat mat, or if you have, um, basically you just have limited space, but you want a lot of plants, then I start them in a three or a four inch pot. And I don't necessarily have to fill it to the tippy top. I still do the settling thing. Dum, dum, dum. Here I'm going to put Carmen on the heat mat over here. And we'll look at that in a second. Okay, now I'm going to do the part where I talked about just sprinkling them on the top. So now I'm using Midnight Roma Tomato. This is by a company called Row 7. That was a bunch of chefs on the East Coast, Brooklyn, I think, that started breeding plants for their deliciousness. That is the main, that is the point. So these seeds are extremely small, a little Roma Tomato. And I'm just going to kind of sprinkle them on the top of the soil, spread them around a little bit. Cover them, pop them down, water them in. And then the difference between this and the other one is once these guys, I mean, there's, there's too many plants in here to be happy, um, to be happy and, and to grow up for a long time, they will get crowded. So what I want to do is make sure I um, transplant them at a certain point. So this is going to require pricking out, it's called. So I've made my little label. I'm labeling them. And I'm going to put them on the heat mat. And I'm going to take the phone and make you seasick. Okay, can you see the heat mat and the, and the plants? Yes. All right. Um, what I have here are lights and these are, I would not recommend these grow lights because they're not bright enough, but they're LED. And I just wanted to show you how low you need to go. We Once can... they start coming up, you want the light only a couple of inches away from the surface of the soil. Delise, raise your phone a little bit. We can't quite see the light in relationship to the, there you, yeah, that's a little okay. better. Can you move a little closer to them? I just want to <laughs> show that. Yeah. Does that do it? No, that makes you blind. No, but we get the idea. You get the idea. Mm -hmm. And here's another light system I have. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. All right. That was that. And I think we can unpin now. And I'll go back to sharing. Denise, Any questions Denise. about the demo? Or anything else we've talked about so far? Well, we do have some questions we can go back to. Are you ready for that? Well, I think we have time. Sure, let's take some questions now and we'll take some more later. Okay. Um, right. You got it, Denise? Delise? I think I think so. Yeah, okay. some are a little bit uh, way back there. <laughs> um, one was talking about um, the night temperatures when you're actually, uh, what is the coldest that you can have for successful growth? I think this was well, about- You don't, you yeah, don't want to plant out before it's, you don't want to plant anything out before it's 50 degrees at night. But you can start, the point of starting indoors with artificial heat and artificial light is so that you can start the seedlings in a warmer climate and wait for that, uh, those warmer temperatures to happen. You're getting a jump start by doing all this artificial stuff. All right. Um, talking about crop rotation, um, what's the distance recommended from where the tomatoes were the previous year? Oh, such a good question. Um, I, I can't even answer that. You want them to be 
as far away as possible. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, there's no boundaries in soil. Microbes move around. So, yeah, if it was in a raised bed at one end or the other, I would just not plant in that raised bed again until I was very sure I'd gotten rid of that disease. And there's only a couple ways to do that. Those ways are <laughs> solarizing the soil, which is a way of covering the soil with, uh, you, you basically take the soil out of commission for a year or at least a summer season. You, you water it well, you cover it with clear plastic. It heats up underneath a lot. And that should bake the pathogens out of the soil. Uh, so that's one way to get rid of it. Um, or you can replace the soil. It's kind of it. All right. You know, okay. Oh, go ahead. Did you see the one about the five years? Uh, is it seasons? In other words, for crop rotation, is five years best? Or will five seasons work if you're growing in the winter as well? Mm -hmm. Well, for tomatoes, we're talking about um, uh, pathogens that are specific to um, tomatoes, eggplants, and peppers, and basil, I believe, too. Uh, fusarium and verticillium wilt in particular. Um, so it's not everything. These soil-borne diseases are not going to affect everything because the triad is you have to have the you have to have the environment, you have to have a susceptible host, and you have to have a pathogen. So not every host is, or not every plant is susceptible to those particular pathogens. Um, so seasonal doesn't, doesn't, isn't really a thing with tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants because they, they are a one, one season crop. They go through the spring and summer and into the fall and there you go, game over. <laughs> so it's every year, bottom line. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, we're going on a different direction here. What size pot should be used for peppers? It depends on the pepper. If it's a container pepper, a small pepper. Um, I, gosh. It's going to depend on the plant. I know for tomatoes, you want a minimum of 20 gallons usually. Um, peppers I've gotten away with with a 10 inch pot in the past but it really depends on the pepper all right I think this one's kind of been answered but I'll double check with you the name of the seeds from the Brooklyn chef I think we came up with row seven is Correct. that right okay all right um, it's a very limited one. set of seeds oh. but they're oh. they're they're unusual and cool and expensive <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I got a quick one. What are good companion plants? Good companion plants for these these plants. The I... only one that I've really heard uh, has a synergistic benefit, which is all not science based. It's kind of word of mouth, but people often grow tomatoes and basil basil together. Good. Yeah, right. I don't know of anything that is antagonistic. You just want to make sure everybody has proper spacing. Uh, and they're all heavy feeders. They all want a lot of nitrogen. So you don't want competition. Right. All right. Here's a question that leads right into something else. Does Monterey Master Gardeners have an annual tomato plant sale? Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> Who on the call wants to answer that? I know there's... I know there's a master gardener plant person on, on here. I think just as we asked, it popped right up there that the <laughs> master gardener spring plant sale will be April 18th to May 1st this year and will feature lots of tomato varieties. Thank you, Charlene. <laughs> and, and peppers, I believe. Yes. And maybe even an eggplant or two if you guys grow some little ones. Okay, awesome. Yeah, it's a great plant sale. Um, lovingly grown by master gardeners. Can't recommend it highly enough. There we go. All right, the questions are starting to roll right in here. So uh, what about <laughs> companion flower plants? Do you have anything about that? 
Um, I would say the same thing. Flowers are always good for beneficials. Uh, there are there are some caterpillars and such that eat tomatoes and and uh, solanaceous plants, but uh, so yeah, any any flowers. There are no flowers that are bad that I can think of, um, and you just want to give a, give it enough birth. So give it enough room that you're not competing for resources and water and fertilizer. So you want companion flowers that are growing in the same season. Cosmos grows in the same season. Um, and an annual, probably, because you're going to disturb the soil with these annual uh, vegetables. How's that for a not answer? <laughs> there you go. I put marigolds next to mine. Marigolds uh, have been known to uh, deter nematodes, root nematodes. So that is scientifically uh, studied and indicated. Teeny little thing. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, so talking about the peppers, <clears throat> excuse me, the really hot ones not getting very hot in cooler climates like we have, can those be grown in successfully in the Salinas Monterey area? Or is the growing season just not long enough to support those types of peppers? Well, every year I try to grow habaneros and get really hot habaneros because I really want some really hot salsa for my, my nephew. Um, I have never gotten a really, really, really hot habanero. <laughs> I live a mile and a half, two miles from the ocean. So I have pretty much, I have a lot of sun. They get full sun. They get everything they should have. They just don't get the heat. And if you live in gosh, um, San Benito County, you might get enough heat to make them really, really warm. But think about Arizona. That's where they're going to get really hot. We don't have 100 degree, degree weather for days and days and days and days. Um, they're they're going to be tasty. They're going to be spicy. Uh, they're going to make some people's heads blow up, but depends on what you're used to. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, how about having any luck with trellising a tomato plant, like on a string? I have never done that. I'm not the person to answer that question. I am a let it just sprawl all over the place tomato grower. <laughs> so is anybody on this call able to talk about training trellising vertical tomatoes? If you are, please step up. All right. There's literally hundreds of years of experience on this call. There's many master gardeners on the call. <laughs> Don't be shy. All right. Let's see. Well, we'll give that well, a, I, a chance. Oh, this on. is this is Barbara Davidge, and I just want to chime in. My my um my trellising uh, situation isn't necessarily. I I use the Love Apple Farm. The um. I believe they call it um, like cattle fencing. It, it's I'm I'm kind of drawing a blank on the name, but we oh, sold wow. we sold them last year at our plant sale. Um, and when you buy the what is it called, Delise? Is it hog wire? What, what did you call it? I, I call it hog wire. It's about four. Or actually, four it's it's hog wire. But I now that I think about it, it's it's concrete rebar. So it's a roll. And it looks, it looks like um, it's, it's not like rebar, thick, thick rebar. It's probably like three millimeters or so, but you can make a cage out of that. It's a one and done. I'm on my probably 12th year with them. You just need a little bit of space to store them. But if you can go in with a bunch of friends, um, if you go on to Love Apple Farms, website they talk about that um process and i did it i bought everything i bought the the like lego looking you know where you put the pieces together and you make a square and then you take it down at the end of the year and i've done all the different you know um ideas for trellising but that was the one that really worked for me and it's it, you can grow peas on it you can grow any other sort of vegetables yeah, there you go. And well, it's actually, it's funny. I don't think it's that expensive at Home Depot, but I could be wrong. But um, 
it's uh, it, it's it's a great solution if you have space to store it. That is the only caveat. But if you're going to keep it in your garden, some of mine just stay in the garden all year round, and I just grow peas on it in the winter and whatnot. So that's that's my solution. Thank you for reminding me of that. I I took the Love Apple Farm class, and I have that as a resource in the back of the book. Um, so yes, what you what she has you do is you take this six, six foot tall fencing, this wire fencing, and then you just wrap it in a circle around the plant and stake it down and the plant grows up it. And um, that's, that's a solution. There's a very specific way though to, that I have not done where you can train it up a single lead and that's a pruning solution. So if that was what the question was, we don't have an answer, but happily we have a sort of an answer <laughs> with the hog wire. <laughs> right. Let's move on. What else? All right. Uh, what do you use to fertilize tomatoes and peppers in the middle of the season? In the middle of the season. So we're going to talk in just a minute about planting out and what you want to put in the planting hole. Uh, you want to heavily fertilize when you first um, plant. And then if you need to augment, you can side dress, you can use organic fertilizer powders. And depending on what time of the plant's life cycle, early on, you wanna use high nitrogen. When it starts fruiting and flowering, you wanna use a lot of phosphorus. So phosphorus, um, calcium, those kind of things, they are not mobile in the soil. That means if you put them on top of the soil, they are not gonna percolate down to the root system very easily. They need to be broken down to get there. And it takes a lot of time. Mineralization is what that's called. So what you wanna do is, <clears throat> is make sure that especially the phosphorus and the calcium that you're gonna add happen at the root system when you plant. And then you can top dress with fish meal, feather meal, cottonseed meal, any of the nitrogen fertilizers. Um, I am a strictly organic gardener, so I know about those kind of fertilizers. I don't usually use chemical fertilizers, but those are an option for those of you that do that. Um, and there are liquid phosphorus options that will percolate down. So, but we'll talk about fertilizer in just a minute. Okay. All right, um, any pitfalls on growing tomatoes in a greenhouse? Um, we talked about aphids, white fly. There are things that happen in greenhouses that don't happen out in the world. Um, so funguses might be a problem if it's too, too hot and moist. Um, yeah, those are, are the type of problems you might run into. Right. And you could um, maybe even overwinter them if you were in a greenhouse the whole year round. There we go. Um, oh, here's a, a probably a really pertinent question um, about rotation, crop rotation. Um, you mentioned rotating the tomato plants. Um, does that also include not growing any other nightshade plants in the tomato soil? That's a good question. I do not know, and maybe one of the other master gardeners knows if fusarium and verticillium on tomatoes also affects uh, peppers and eggplants. I know that basil can get fusarium wilts. I'm suspecting it would transfer, but does anybody have any idea? Trink, who teaches IPM with me. <laughs> I'm afraid I, I, I don't know specifically, but it is probably something we could look up and get back to somebody on. The bottom line is you want to avoid getting it. Yep. Never get those soil borne diseases if you can avoid it. <laughs> and once you do, you're doomed to grow these type of plants in containers. All right, let's see. I think the only other question I'm seeing here is um, what are your favorite tomato varieties, which may not be the direction you're going today. <laughs> let's save that till the end. Will you remember to ask it at the end? Indeed. Let's get through the, uh, let's, let's, let's open that up to the group. Everybody think about your favorite tomato variety and uh, 
we'll answer that as a group and then uh, I will get through these slides and we'll do more Q&A. Okay, things that can happen bad. We just talked about this. You need to get a disease, you have to have an environment that's conducive to the disease, you have to have the disease and you have to have a plant that gets that disease. So for you, did we already see this? We did see this before, didn't we? No, we didn't. No, we didn't. I'm sorry, I'm confusing myself. No, we didn't. Okay. So aphids can happen. Those are easy to deal with. You just kind of squish them. You hit them hard with a bunch of water. Leaf miners can happen, but that's not so much a tomato thing. Um, I have repurposed a uh a seed starting uh general seed starting slide deck so excuse me if not everything's completely pertinent the thing you do want to worry about is damping off disease and we talked about a little bit earlier it's a fungal disease it's in the soil and it's um it affects the young stems it happens when you overwater or it's too cold and um and if it's stretched, if the plant's weakened and it's falling over, it can happen. You can wipe out your entire planting and have to start all over if you get damping off disease. This is why we wash the pots. There's a product called Root Shield, and it is um, a really useful biological fungicide that will basically kill the bad, bad fungus replace it with good fungus and prevent this from happening. It's been very effective for the UCSC farm and garden. Um, and it's really expensive and it has a lifespan of about six months. So get together with all your friends. When you're buying hog wire, you can also buy a bottle of root shield and pass it around. And this is what it looks like. It looks like the somebody squeezed the bottom of the plant and it just falls over, so sad. If you're afraid that you're gonna get that, sterile soil mix might be a better way to go and make sure your light and water are proper. Um, once things are outside, <clears throat> you can run the risk of slugs and snails and birds and the dog and anything else that might wanna come and disturb your, your little planting. Um, so I recommend covering any new planting with floating row or just that tool that you can buy for wedding veils. That's a really light, really cheap, really easy way to prevent uh, small insects, birds, and other things from getting into your tiny seedlings. It doesn't help much with slugs and snails. Though. And then once you have grown your beautiful little tomato, pepper, or eggplant plants, and you have uh, at least two sets of true leaves, not that cotyledon, but true leaves, and you think you're getting ready to plant them into the ground, you start a process called hardening off. And you also start fertilizing them a little bit more. So hardening off are, is, is a way of um, basically toughening up the plant. The cell walls thicken, carbohydrates are reserved. It just really becomes a more resilient plant by taking it outside for, for periods of time over a total of 72 hours for a week, basically. You take it out of its uh, little carefully, beautifully lit zone in your garage or wherever you're doing your artificial light and you put it out in the full sun and you, or, or actually you start in shade, you put it in light shade and you put it out for two hours, then maybe four hours then maybe six hours, and then maybe you put it in, in full sun, and uh, eventually you're gonna leave it outside overnight. So that's an important thing to do. You um, don't wanna transplant before you have a nice root knit. That means that you have about as much root growing as you have plant growing on top. So that's, um, that's gonna be the, the proper time to transplant. And you won't really know that until you take it out of the pot and look at the roots. When you're doing hardening off, it's a good time to use some uh, uh, liquid fertilizer. You can you can top dress with, or you can you can water in um, 
a liquid balanced fertilizer. And then you get to transplant. So again, we're looking for enough root to really get it started. And they shouldn't be bound. So if you're buying trans, if you're buying plants at the store, at the plant store, and you're seeing a big, gorgeous, juicy looking plant on the top, you might want to pull it out of the six pack and peek at the roots. They might be root bound. They might be circling. They might be really unhappy. And then it's very hard to get them to acclimate to the soil. You have to kind of tear them apart. It sets it back a little bit. So that's important whether you're you're purchasing um, already growing seedlings or figuring out when to transplant your own. Again, at least two sets of true leaves. And then planting them deep. So solanums, plants in this family, have what's called adventitious roots. And that means that roots grow out of the stem. Now this is really true for tomatoes. They, they have very powerful adventitious stems. So I usually pick off the, the bottom two or three sets of leaves and then plant them quite, quite a bit deeper than they were in their little pots. And that gives you a much deeper root system that picks up more nutrients, more water, makes them uh, much happier over time. Um, peppers and eggplants have that also, but to a lesser degree. So I usually plant them up to their first set of true leaves. You don't ever bury the true leaves. You have to cut, you, you wanna take them off if they're at risk of being buried because you don't want them to start to rot and rot the plant. You wanna read the seed packet and find out what the spacing should be, how far apart they should be. Um, a good time of day is very early in the morning. That's minimize the, uh, you know, want to give them a few minutes of, of not hot baking sun to, um, to just get used to being in the ground. <clears throat> and, um, or end of the day, sort of five o'clock in the afternoon is another good time to transplant them. And then there is the fertilization in the ground. So we just talked about how um, bone meal and, and phosphorus um, and calcium fertilizers don't travel in the soil. They just stay where they are. And if you put them near the roots, the roots will find them. So this is Love Apple Farms, incredibly intense fertilizer mix. For each plant they plant, for each tomato, this is tomato specific, by the way, one cup of fish meal, one cup of balanced organic granular fertilizer, one cup of bone meal, a couple of eggshells, a cup of worm castings. And that's really important because that basically gives you the compost to activate uh, the interaction that makes all those organic fertilizers available to the plant. And then there's this weird thing with two aspirin tablets. You crush up two aspirin tablets and there is something about that, that um, and there's, there's research on it uh, that Love Apple Farm uh, points to, links to, that you can read all about that. But I tried it last year and my gosh, it was successful. Okay, let's go back to our favorite tomato question. Um, we actually have a pepper have. question. <laughs> we have a pepper question. Let's ask we have that. a pepper question. All right. Um, so um, I, this is maybe uh, with all the people who are on this uh, this little link here, maybe we can come up with an idea. Um, this is, uh, let's see, there's a pepper in my garden that has lived for three years now. It's about six feet tall and has very hot, small black peppers. It was there when they moved in. Any ideas? <laughs> no idea. Like I said, there are 50,000 varieties of pepper, but it, it's just a perennial pepper that never goes away. Is yeah, it's there all of the time. Um, and I, my father-in-law uh, is from Mexico and he's a gardener and he doesn't know the name of it, but he was like, leave it be. And it doesn't die. It, it's the strangest thing. And it's very spindly. It looks very ill, but it every summer is like very, very hot peppers. Huh. 
Well, I would recommend taking a handful of those peppers up to Orrin Martin at UCSC, um, at the UCSC Farm and Garden. Where, where are you located? We're in Watsonville. Susan Penny says they're Pekin, an evergreen pepper, maybe. It's worth looking into. Let's go look at a Pekin. Why not? Do we have time for this? <laughs> I don't know, this eggplant's a little obscene. I have to get rid of it. <laughs> there was a question about the Love Apple Farm fertilizer mix, and it was that much for each plant. Was that correct? I really said that. It's true. Yep. <laughs> Amazing, okay. but true. Yeah. Okay. You need to definitely mix it into the soil and don't put your plant right in it. Um, so the plant roots should be touching soil, not fertilizer. Okay, I'm looking up this Pekin pepper. Uh, do they look like this? Whoever has The actual fruit is like black they're very strange huh you got some research to do there i don't know fantastic interesting thank you so much <laughs> okay next question uh, all right um let's minutes. see it was about uh, blossom end rot it was a huge problem last year they did use the love apple farm fertilizer uh, not that that's necessarily the whole answer, but what could prevent that in the future? The blossom end run. It's related to calcium uptake and watering. So um, we recommend the eggshells and the bone meal in the root zone, but they use the love apple farm fertilizer mix. So that shouldn't be it. So it may have been uh, that they withheld water towards the end or the heat stress, which is too much for the plant. Might want to try a hybrid this year and not, was this a, was it a, a, an heirloom? I think it was uh, more, uh, yes, it was. Okay. So I would uh, use the same treatment, do a little experiment and plant some very hardy um basic hybrid tomato and see if the same thing happens of course every year is different climate is different every year we never know what's going to happen so it's not a true experiment but you can try and somebody suggested a ricotto pepper for that perennial pepper i'm growing some ricottos but they're big like big they're this big and they're certainly not black but it could be in the family Shall I just answer the questions as they come in now? Uh, you could if you want. I was going to say that, uh, Trink, you found that both the peppers and eggplants are susceptible to the uh, fusarium and the fusarium um, wilt. So that could be an issue when you're doing your um, crop rotation. So. Good point. Otherwise, go ahead from the bottom there, please. Uh, do you leave your lights on 24 seven? The answer is no. You want to give them a, a little rest at night. So I buy, I have a timer that um, I, I use and it turns the lights off automatically. Um, how many hours do I give them? Gosh. I think at least eight hours of sleep, six to eight hours of, of dark time. And they're on the rest of the time. Sure. Right. Yeah, that's yes. all the questions. That's, that's right. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming, everybody. Um, you will get this recording and you'll get the presentation. And there, oh, I have some more presentation links, actually. Let's quickly go back here. Am I sharing? Not, Emily. Not yet.
I'm not sharing. How rude is that? Now I don't even know where I'm going. Okay, share screen. There it is. Uh, reverse these. Okay. <laughs> All right, everybody is going to receive a survey and it's going to ask you how this class was because we want to keep doing better. I get better and better and better. So give us your feedback. It will include a question of what do you want us to teach? So think about that. And then in your email, within a couple of weeks, you should get an email from the California Master Gardener program. They will also ask you a few questions. We really encourage you to answer those questions because this is how the Master Gardener program shows that they have an impact. They want to know that you're using the information that we're delivering here. And if they are, then they've made an impact and that's how they make money. That's how they get donors. So um, that's a really important follow-up and thank you for answering that when it comes. And then we have classes coming up uh, next month, we have fruit tree pruning. It's going to be a virtual class, kind of an overview. Um, and that's going to be like this on, on online. And then we're going to have it in person, hopefully, in San Juan Batista, as we wait for the microbial universe to stop bothering us. <laughs> but uh, keep an eye on that. It's going to be limited um, number of people. You can register for it right now. It's online at uh, mbmg.org, our website. When you get the, um, get the slide deck, you will see resources. I've included planning tools, links to how to, how to find the right seeds, um, how to read a six pack, some recipes for seed starting mixes, more on how to do the pricking out. So these are planted close together like I did in the second planting that I did. And then this is how you will, um, I wish I had some to do for you in person, but um, how you kind of lift them out, holding them by the leaf, and then plant each one in its own little container. Um, something on saving seeds, if you're interested. Planning and timing for us, we are going to be starting seeds pretty soon. It'll be about six weeks before, um, before we do anything. And like I said, I recommend you hold your plants. I usually pot them up to a four inch pot. So I have a pretty big robust plant before I put it in the ground. And that allows me to get all the way to April. March, end of March, April. Um, and that's the appropriate time for us to be planting. And that's it. So let's call it a day. We, we did Thank talk you. about uh, asking for anyone's favorite uh, tomatoes. The only thing that's come up so far in the chat is uh, a concurrence on the Inca Jewel. So anything else anyone else thinks is fabulous in that area. Another, another good container tomato is called super bush. It's very delicious and productive and very compact. So I really like that one. I, I grew something called a white ox heart. I shouldn't have, I shouldn't be able to grow it. It's one of those big old giant heirlooms. And it was the best tasting tomato I ever ate in my life. It doesn't like, um, afternoon sun, so it'll take a little bit of shade even. Um, but that was that was a fun one to grow. A few more showed up in the, uh, there we go. Now we're getting some. <laughs> <laughs> so you wanna read them? Oh, uh, let's see. We've got sun gold, a couple of people like green zebra, German lunchbox, I love the names of these. Uh, <laughs> let's see, uh, Juliet, Big Rainbow, Lucky Tiger. Do love the names. <laughs> uh, so a yellow pear cherry. 
But one that comes up a lot is purple Cherokee. People seem to be successful with it. It's one of those big uh, old fashioned tomatoes, but um, it, it, it seems to work for folks. So try it. Hosted piece is a very nice one. Bread in, um, in the um, Eastern Europe. So it's a little cooler. It's bread, bread for cooler weather and it's early. Also tasty. Fourth of yeah. July is fun. <laughs> <laughs> Carmelo is another classic. This has been great. All right, let's call it a day. Thank you all very much. We'll look for you on other classes. Bye.